arboreal forests are spreading out across the northern hemisphere like a green belt. Here lies the Kingdom of Sweden whose forests constitute less than 1% of the world's forest acreage, but which yield 5% of all forestry products used in the world, and a whole 10% of the turnover of the global export market. How can that be possible? The answer lies in a unique method of sustainable forestry called the Swedish model. But it's been a long haul to get where we are today. A hundred years ago, large areas of the Swedish forests were heavily exploited with little replenishment. Back then, the forests were very different from today. They were decimated by felling, they were sparse and often influenced by forest grazing, while at the same time the conservation value of the forest was high, mainly because we had a lot of old timber still standing. But in the 1800s, logging had increased significantly and the regrowth was very low. Things got so bad that during the late 1800s, the Swedish state realized that something had to be done. The forests had to remain an important source of raw materials for the future which resulted in the world's first legislation on forest management in 1903. Yes, it meant that they attempted to secure a long-term supply of forestry-associated products in Sweden. Put simply, sustainability meant that whoever removed forest had the responsibility of replenishing it. The law stipulated the type of forest to be felled, as well as the fraction of forest which could be cut in any given area. A government agency was formed to ensure that these regulations were adhered to, a ministry which today is known as the Swedish Forest Agency. The Forest Agency's mission is to see to it that the country's forests are managed in such a way that the government and parliament have defined, which means working to achieve managed sustainability. Of course, we have a responsibility to ensure that the regulations are adhered to according to the Act of Parliament. We also have an advisory role to play towards landowners' operations. Thirdly, we have the vitally important task of following up the forest progress throughout the country. Slowly, the Swedish forest landscape began changing shape. Sparse forests with low growth rates were felled and new forest land was laid out. Gradually, the forest landscape became a patchwork of timber stands of different ages. The goal was to achieve a situation where there were ample forests with timber of all age groups. What was needed was a very long-term plan. A tree that was a sapling in the early 1900s was ready for harvesting a hundred years later. The overall purpose of the transformation was to create conditions for a secure and sustainable supply of timber needs to cover Sweden's upcoming requirements. To enable long-term sustainable forestry, all forest land was inventoried. The National Forest Inventory was launched already in 1923 and has given Sweden unique knowledge. This knowledge is being used today to decide upon how to utilize Sweden's forests. It was during the 70s that the environmental movement was gaining influence. The Forestry Act came to be a target of criticism and debate, particularly as the clear-cutting method was very intense. Many argued that the law was too narrowly directed towards production and economics. It did not take sufficiently into account the natural values and biodiversity of the forests. The debate led to a new forest policy and a new legislation. The big change was that both the environment and forest production became equal goals in forestry policy. It also meant that the general public clearly defined how they wanted the forests to develop. One wanted more alternative logging methods instead of clear-cutting. Also, more leaf-bearing or deciduous trees. What it also meant was that you removed a lot of detailed requirements within the legislation itself. Disclosure was no longer mandatory. Badly growing forests were no longer required to be compulsorily felled. As the collective claims against the forest increased, there was a need for trade-offs. Maximizing production as well as the environmental collateral isn't easy in the same stretch of forest. Forest managers face the challenge of balancing production against the environmental goals. 
Karina Nigren Svensson is one of over 300,000 private individuals who own woodland in Sweden. She has been living off of agriculture and her forests, which have been handed down for six generations. We are farmers and foresters, so the forest economy is important. Some members of our family are interested in fishing and hunting, so the forest is ideal because it's full of deer, moose, beavers and bears. In the late summer and autumn, we're often in the forest to pick berries and to see what work needs to be done. For example, whether we should thin the stands or maybe even do some logging. In Sweden, half of all forest lands are owned by private individuals. Another quarter is owned by private companies and the rest is owned by the state and the church. The same forestry laws apply to all categories of interested parties. To be able to comply with the law requires knowledge and commitment from managers. He or she must possess a certain amount of knowledge about forestry management, economics and ecology. Our forest is certified and we manage it according to a forestry plan so that our activities are sustainable and that the forest retains its value in the long term for our children and grandchildren. Forest landowners in Sweden have considerable freedom to manage their forests in any way they wish, though it does bring with it many obligations. This policy is summarized usually as freedom with responsibility. This policy places great demands upon the forest managers and landowners. You have to have devised some kind of mission statement for owning the land and your forestry operations, which also places considerable burden upon your knowledge of how different production methods affects the forest itself. In addition to the obligation of replacing harvested timber with new forest, the law requires that consideration be shown to other aspects of the forest, such as recreation, tourism, cultural relics and, of course, the nature itself. Today, the balance between the environment and production is once again a topical subject. Sharp criticisms have been directed at the Swedish Forest Agency by environmental organizations. There are several areas where the views of the interested parties tend to differ. One important area is the proportion of protected forests, that is to say the area of set-aside forest needed to succeed in preserving biodiversity. But then on the other hand, there is also a conflict about what one may do in the managed part of the landscape. There are differing opinions about the logging methods employed, such as clear-cutting. There is also a lot of discussion about how much nature consideration should be taken during harvesting. The Association for the Protection of Forests is one of a number of Swedish environmental organizations that are critical of modern forestry. Swedish forestry as it stands today is the single greatest threat to biodiversity in Sweden. I base this upon two criteria. Firstly, most of the endangered red-listed species live in the forest and secondly, forestry affects more than half of the Swedish land acreage. The most important thing is to prevent the conversion of natural forest to monocultural plantations with single tree species. But instead, after felling, sow seed trees so that you get a natural regeneration of different kinds of trees. Don't just plant one kind of tree, but bring some mixed seedlings with you so that in the future you will have mixed forests. Naturally, this will increase the biodiversity greatly, compared to monocultures. The discussions about the balance between forestry and nature conservation are topical once more, while the effects of the 90s forestry policy are becoming noticeable. Approximately 1% of the Swedish forests are harvested each year. This means that the increased environmental concerns are reflected by about 20% of forest land. That is to say, the proportion of forest land harvested since the middle of the 90s. A lot has happened in the forest during the last 20 years. Within forestry, new approaches have been developed, such as ecological landscape planning or the creation and retention of important structures for forest species, for example, deadwood. There are certain indications that these measures have had positive effects. But in reality, 20 years is too short a time to draw many conclusions. 
It is mainly due to the fact that the rotation periods are so long in the boreal forests. And this is also true for many other ecological processes, which also require a lot of time. In Sweden, society's needs for timber is increasing. For example, forests have become one of the main sources of energy, while the rest of the world increases its needs for renewable energy significantly. Proportionately, the European Union has set extremely high targets for the supply of energy from renewable sources. This means that demand for forestry products will increase in the near future, as demand will exceed supply. Forests can play a crucial role in supplying the world with raw materials. Forest products can be used for everything from building and heating homes, developing medicines, clothes and chemicals. Wood will be used for an incredible number of things in the future. You just have to look at what things were like 20 years ago, compared to how they are today. Previously, we could really only extract pulp and warmth from our facilities. Now we have composite materials, textile pulp, even pine tree diesel. Then looking ahead, we will be able to win organic polymers like lignin and hemicellulose, a black viscous byproduct from the mill's operations. A great potential for the future. The challenge to researchers is to find ways to adapt the woodlands to all requirements. Recreation, hunting and fishing, adventure, biodiversity, pure water, renewable energy and raw materials. The demands upon the forests are ever-growing. Yes, some of the major challenges that face us is balancing and prioritizing two different conflicting interests. The ambition is to meet all the claims upon the forests. But the challenge is to find that sensible balance of how to use the landscape as a whole. The reason is that all interests cannot be accommodated on every stretch of woodland. With a forest industry based upon sound scientific principles and a forestry policy under constant development, Sweden has gone from being a country under deforestation to be the most densely forested country within the European Union. Now we are all facing the big challenge. How do we use the world's forests in a future that has to rely upon renewable resources? Is the Swedish model part of that solution?